Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the Old Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the D program. Thank you so, so much for the time, for the energy, and for the attention, and for letting me violate your ear holes with this filthy, filthy, sonically transmitted discourse. And this one is pretty filthy, if I may say. That's because returning guest Douglas Rushkoff is back to spit some hot fire about his latest book, Team Human, a manifesto written with one goal in mind, to remake society and culture in our image and in our favor, to reconnect with ourselves and with each other, and to return to our roots as these social creatures we truly are, with face-to-face interactions IRL, as they say in the not-so-social media. For those of you who don't know Doug or didn't hear him way back in episode 17 on this show or on countless others, he is perhaps the most accomplished guest to grace the airwaves with me. He's an award-winning author, broadcaster, and documentarian who studies human autonomy in the digital age. He hosts the wildly popular Team Human podcast, has written more than 20 books, contributes regular columns to Medium, CNN, Daily Beast, and The Guardian, and has made two PBS frontline documentaries. He's also coined such concepts as viral media and social currency. He's currently a research fellow of the Institute for the Future and founder of the Laboratory for Digital Humanism at CUNY Queens, where he is also a professor of media theory and digital economics. In this chat is Doug firmly in his element, riffing on topics such as technology's anti-human agenda, digital and social media, spiritual pursuits, language, nature, and art, You will absolutely hear why Doug was named one of the world's 10 most influential intellectuals by MIT. And a quick note, there's no Patreon extension here due to the length of the chat, so this is the full show for everyone. I originally did have about 20 minutes of it chunked out for an extension, but, you know, based on the material, I just want everyone to hear it all. And hear it all, I hope you do. Douglas Rushkoff is back in the house right now. Douglas Rushkoff, welcome back to the show, man. Uh, You've been quite busy here recently with a new book, so it means a lot for you to take some time here for me. Oh, thanks for having me. No problem, man. No problem. Uh, Most people know you from your catalog of titles that you published up to this point, but your most recent book is called Team Human. Uh, It's also the podcast that you've been doing for what, maybe about two or three years now? Yeah, a little over two years. I've been doing it every week, and I just realized that you don't have to do it every week, that people take a (laughs) hiatus sometimes. Yeah, it's okay to take a break, man. You know, I actually want to start by explaining that term for people who don't know how you use it, you know, team human, because it sounds simple, but I also think it has a a rich complexity to it as well. So, you know, what does that term team human mean exactly? What is that phrase supposed to invoke when someone interacts with it? Well, it's funny, it kind of changed for me over time. I mean, originally, it was sort of my response to Ray Kurzweil on a panel when he was arguing for the singularity and the coming superiority of our machines. And I was arguing that humans should have a place in the digital future and that humans are special and wonderful. And then he said, oh, Rushkoff, you're just saying that because you're a human. You know, like it was some kind of a hubris. And so I answered, fine, I'm I'm guilty as charged. I'm on team human. As (laughs) if just to to make a stand and say, I, I refuse to consider it you know, a, a crime of some kind, you know, to to want to preserve a place or a role for humans in the in the digital future to, you know, to make the, the argument that we may not know everything there is to know about humanity and consciousness. And it's just possible that the profiles that we're currently putting into algorithmic form don't embrace the full complexity of what it means to be human. And even if they have some emergent properties that they still might miss out on human consciousness. And uh, so so that's sort of where it started. And then as I use the term more, I realized that team human actually is is significant for its its teamness, not just its humanness. And and I became really um I guess committed to the idea that being human is a team sport. That it's not something we can do that we can do alone. You know, that the truest manifestation or expression of what it means to be human is some kind of community or connection or rapport or solidarity with other people. So now Team Human is really about, you know, finding the others so that we can enable humanity 
at a time when we are steering our media and digital technology really against allowing people to connect in any real way. Yeah, and that's what I love about the podcast. That's what I loved about the book is that team aspect of it because it is something that I think, you know, and we could talk about this later because I do have some questions on it, but in a society that seems to emphasize the will of the individual, it's very unique to to step back and look at it the way that you're looking at it. And you wrote a lot about that in this book. And that book too, Doug, it reads and is structured more like a manifesto. And I, I know some other people have commented to you about that. Was that your intention to present this more in that fashion as opposed to a more traditional book format? Yeah, Team Human is a manifesto. It's it's an argument for preserving and extending humanity into the next into the next age. We've come to a time where someone needs to make an argument for humanity. You know, (laughs) know, in some ways it's it's pathetic that it's reached that point, Mm -hmm. but it's also essential. It's important that you know, in a time when we're spending trillions of dollars to try to defeat our social defense mechanisms, you know, all of the mechanisms that we evolved painstakingly over, you know, 500,000 years of, of evolution to establish rapport and forge solidarity, when all of those mechanisms are being kind of specifically targeted and disabled by algorithms and social media and all sorts of uh, sort of mean psychological and and marketing manipulation that yeah you know it's it's time to stand up and say no you know <laughs> we're not going to take it anymore um, and not just that not just we're going to go and change the the structures but we're going to enhance our own collective immune system that there's a sort of two ways to look at these these problems you know one which is a little bit less than a manifesto one would be sort of a call for regulation and new algorithms to fight the bad algorithms, or let's develop companies this way or change companies that way. And the other is to look back at the humans themselves, which is what I'm doing, to say, look, why don't we build up our own immune defense mechanisms? Why don't we, you know, strengthen our cultural immunity to bad memes and and manipulative technologies? You know, let's, let's increase human vitality rather than worrying so much about attacking our supposed enemies. Absolutely, man. I could not agree with that more. And I want to read a quote here uh, from the book. You wrote that uh, everyone is asking how we got here as if this were a random slide toward collective incoherence and disempowerment. It is not. There's a reason for our current predicament, uh, end quote. And I, I know this answer is complex, probably. So take this wherever you like. But what is that reason for this predicament that we're in? I mean, I guess mainly that there, there are all sorts of anti-human biases of different media and technologies and systems. And over history, we move back and forth sort of between the humanizing and anti-humanizing biases of many of the media that we've, uh, you know, that we've used. But um, with digital, it seems we've gone, you know, pedal to the metal with the anti-human stuff, with the extractive corporate capitalism, with the, the surveillance state, with the automation of human behavior, with the you know, intentional repression of novelty with the denial of social connection and rapport, that these are real, you know, that you can go to a real division at Stanford University and take courses in captology, which is how to control and modify human behavior with technology. You know, you can go to uh, Snapchat and, and Facebook and you can see the books that they're using to port the addiction algorithms from Las Vegas slot machines into our social media feeds. So what I'm trying to do is to say, look, this is not some random thing. It's not just, oh, look, technology sort of alienates us a bit, kind of, from one another, or the marketplace sort of has some things that kind of make people maybe a little more suspicious. No, these are intentional. These are in the, you know, these are in the instruction manuals. That's what this stuff is for. These are not mere side effects of one thing or another. This is, you know, corporate capitalism on digital steroids. And if we don't sort of go back and deconstruct and look at what are all of these anti-human underlying assumptions that we're embedding in our technologies, from the need to control people to 
um, living in a, a, an attention economy to thinking that democracy is going to end up working as a, a competition for for people's opinions, you know, uh, uh, manipulated through uh, mimetics and media. I mean, we've got, you know, we've got some real, real explaining to do. You know, <laughs> we've got we've got to look at the sort of the core codes of our culture that we are enhancing and amplifying with digital technology and algorithms and machines. And once we do, we'll see, oh, look what we're doing. You know, we are really trying to optimize humanity for the marketplace rather than optimizing technology for human beings. When did this happen? You know, like I'm interested in this from maybe like a like a historical through line. When did this agenda, this anti-human agenda begin? Was it post-World War II? Was it earlier than that? I mean, it it depends. It it keeps coming. You know, it's all kind of always there. Our need to control others, our fear. I mean, when I was really thinking about it, I was thinking about how you know these uh, these billionaires that I met. How the advice they wanted from me was sort of where to position their doomsday bunkers. You know, when I realized that these guys are in such a state of fear that these guys are still, no matter how much money they make. They think that the object of the game is to earn enough money to insulate themselves from the reality that they're creating by earning money in that way. If they're like that, then this is deeper than just, you know, what you or I feel. This is almost innate. And then it's funny. I saw the, um, they did a re-release, Christopher Nolan, the, you know, the Batman movie director, he did a re-release of a, like a cleaned print of, 2001, The Space Odyssey by Kubrick. And I'd forgotten about all those scenes with the kind of monkey people at the beginning, you know, where they're like throwing rocks at each other and stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. And there's there's this one scene where like, you know, the monkey people, after they've like defended their water hole or they do whatever they do, they're sitting there at night, like on the edge of this little cliff. And they're they're like all wide awake. You see their eyes like glued open with fear at night as they're sitting there in the rain and then you hear this uh, creature growling in the background, like, you know, some saber toothed tiger thing. And they're just sitting there waiting to hope that it's not going to come find them and get them. And I was watching that and I was thinking, gosh, how many nights did we stay up like that over how many hundreds of thousands <laughs> of years, you know, in that kind of fear. And I'm thinking that that fear is like, it's like in our cells, you know, it's in our cellular memory. So it's not surprising that when people get a little bit of money or a little bit of power, they, you know, take some slaves or find some guards or put up fences and, and start thinking about how am I going to protect this, that, that this, there's, is a fear driving us. So it's old, you know, and I look at, I look at the first uses of text and they're they're as bad as Facebook. The first uses of text of the written of, of written words that we can find was used to keep track of slaves and possessions by wealthy people way back when in ancient Egypt. You know, the first uses of the printing press were monopolized by the government. You couldn't just print anything you wanted or they'd come and kill you. Or, you know, radio went from ham to commercial radio really quickly. Television was supposed to be about education and it turned into, you know, the education or creation of the American consumer in order to get us to buy stuff we don't need in order to keep factories going. And the internet, you know, likewise went from this possible connector, this sort of hardwiring of the, of the human brain, uh, the collective human imagination into a, uh, a, an extraction Ponzi scheme that we're living with today. So it's like, where does it start? I mean, I think it's way back there. I think it's a, it's a, it's an innate potential at all times. But if we're not aware of it, then we can't work against it. If we're not aware, if we don't accept that everybody's in fear of one another and trying to use these technologies to insulate or isolate themselves, we've got a cultural operating system at this point that's based in alienating us from one another so that we buy things instead of spend time with other people. I mean, it's hard to even see that if you can't acknowledge that kind of the fear in ourselves and and all that all that's kind of i don't know what you call it inner work you know that would would <laughs> yeah. allow us to then see the the outer world in a in a more straightforward fashion 
Yeah, but that inner work, Doug, I don't know if you've done any of that recently. It's pretty fucking difficult. Yeah, it is. I mean, it is, you know, but, but, you know, it starts, that's why, you know, what I'm suggesting is, is it starts by just finding another person, you know, just being able to practice being with other people in real space. You know, that is, is quite literally, that's conspiracy. You know, to conspire means to breathe together, con with, spire, breathe, you breathe with somebody. And to think that in these days, just being with another person is a conspiracy. You're not buying anything. You're not selling anything. You're not creating any data. You know, you're not, you're not <laughs> clicking on anything. You're just being with this other person. And then when you are and you establish rapport and their pupils open to accept you and your breathing rates sync up and the mirror neurons flash in your brain and the oxytocin goes through your bloodstream, you're on your way to solidarity and solidarity is power. You know, once people together are finding strength from one another, then they're no longer looking at authority figures and symbols and all this other stuff. So, you know, I don't know how much inner work I can really do alone. I mean, sitting is cool and all, but but in the end, I find that the work comes in trying to actually be with someone else for any length of time. Yeah, I've been trying to do that the last couple of years, man. Just move my relationships with people outside of that digital space into more of a physical space. But you'd be surprised how many people are resistant to that, though. Have you met that in your own life? Yeah, well, of course they're resistant. It's scary, and there's other people involved. And, you know, who knows? You know, they, they, they may not be nice or, you know, I mean, we're all scared. We're all scared of one another. I mean, it's funny, you know, we're the, the theme of this book, I mean, the, the back cover of it even says, find the others, you know, and originally the others, really, it came from a, a Timothy Leary quote where he had been asked after one of his Berkeley lectures in 1968, like, some young woman had had this psychedelic trip and she asked him what she should do next. And he said, find the others, you know, meaning like find the other people who've had the trip and seen the vision. But, you know, for me, it's come to mean find the others, you know, find the ones who haven't find the people that you consider other, you know, the kid in the MAGA hat or the racist at the Nazi rally, the real other, the, I mean, maybe not the guy at the Nazi rally to start, you know, kind of really (laughs) other, but you know, the person who voted for Trump out of fear or, you know, whoever it is that, that, that seems to be other, you know, and don't engage with them about ideology because ideologies were invented in part to keep us apart from each other anyway. Ideologies are so 20th century as far as I'm concerned, but engage with them on a human level, actually be with that other person. And yeah, it's hard, but you know, in some ways I'm finding it easier to do this with people who are really different with me, different from me than people who are kind of like me. It's like other progressives kind of pick on stuff. Oh, you're, you like, you know, whatever. <laughs> you like Bernie and I like Alexandria or, you know, you, <laughs> it's like, and they'll fight more over that than if they like a Republican and I like a Democrat. That's an interesting perspective there. Yeah. I, I guess I, I have been relating more to people like that in my own life too. The others without really realizing it until you just contextualize it there. So that, that's a great observation. And you mentioned the word conspiracy. I want to go back to the anti-human agenda just for a moment. Yeah. Do we call that a conspiracy? Is there a group of people intentionally conspiring against the human race for whatever reason? I don't know that they're conspiring because I don't know if they're breathing together. I have a feeling they're doing it online. But there are many people in Silicon Valley who believe that human beings are the problem and technology is the solution. So they think, you know, the the cure for human greed maybe is the blockchain, you know, or the cure for human social fear is Facebook and other social media, where I would argue that these technologies exacerbate the problem, that they they institutionalize the problem or embed the problem in the technology rather than helping us you know, move beyond it. So the blockchain doesn't engender trust between people. It it substitutes for trust in some other way. So the people who are promoting that, are they in an anti-human conspiracy? Not really knowingly. You know, they, they're just trying to help and they don't have that much faith in humans' ability to just, you know, to human beings' ability to improve or to evolve or to to act compassionately with one another. So no, I mean, there were moments 
kind of pivot moments where I guess people were consciously acting against the masses or whatever it is that we are. So, you know, you can go to uh, the late Middle Ages when people had developed the marketplace that they borrowed from the Moors, you know, the Moorish Bazaar. They created a marketplace and they had uh, uh, local currencies and people were getting wealthy. The former peasants of feudalism had become the new middle class and they were rising in wealth and power. And yeah, the aristocracy said, we have to stop this by any means necessary. So they made small business illegal. They created these things called chartered monopolies. It's what we had the American Revolution about, the British East India Company, a chartered monopoly that was able to control everyone else's business. You couldn't be in business for yourself. You had to work for one of the monopolies. That's you know nightmarish, and they extracted all our value. Or they invented central currency, you know, and central currency was invented not just as, oh, here's a way we're going to improve economic, you know, development in these places. It was a way to prevent economic growth. Now, instead of having these currencies that were optimized for transactions that were free and cheap, and you could just sort of issue them in the morning and pass them around and get your transactions done, now you had to borrow money from the central treasury at interest. So yeah, that was a conspiracy of the rich to get rich simply by being rich because now everyone had to borrow money from them and pay it back at interest. And where does the other money come from? Well, you've got to grow the economy somehow. So you take over other places and enslave their people and take all their resources, you know, do whatever it is that, that, that we all do these days. And that sort of colonial extractive agenda, that's kind of a conspiracy. That's the same thing you hear going on in the boardroom of a Walmart. It's what you hear in the boardroom of an Uber or a Facebook also. It's how do we take control of this market, extract all the value, and then move on to the next one? Yeah. And I guess obviously, you know, technology plays a large role, maybe the largest in what we're talking about here. And we obviously know tech has done more to disconnect us from each other than it has to connect us, despite the fact that it it does make us more accessible in theory to each other throughout a given day. But, you know, these are, as you say in the book, sort of like mediated experiences instead of directly lived ones and that we're more alone than ever before. And you said something really thought-provoking here that I'd love for you to expand on. You said that all these technologies are undermining our respect for one another and our respect for ourselves, and that this is also by design. How can that be? You know, like, how do these technologies undermine our respect for each other and for ourselves? And why would anybody want to design such things that do that? Well, partly because of capitalism. We live in a world where we look at other people in terms of their utility value. You know, what are the inputs and outputs? What can they provide for me or for my company? You know, we we look at even, you know, school children. You know, school was originally developed as compensation for a life of work. It was so that the coal miner could come home and, you know, have the dignity of being able to read a book or understand the issues in the newspaper and vote effectively. You know, and these days we think of school as job training, the principles of our High schools go to the CEOs of corporations to find out what do you want from the workers of tomorrow? What should we, how should we train our students? Even the presidents of universities are busy doing this. And since when is education about, you know, training the worker, about externalizing the cost of job training to the public sector? You know, that's not what it was for. But, you know, as more and more of our institutions that were originally set up as kind of celebrations of human dignity, become extensions of of human labor or human exploitation you know we start to look at ourselves that way too you know kids want to get into college so that they can get a job they're not thinking about themselves or their betterment or their experience of life they're thinking of you know and it's partly because of economic precarity they're thinking about i got to make sure i'm going to get a career when i'm out of here cuz i'm going to be in $300,000 worth of debt it's a shame that education has devolved to that. But it's partly it's it's the world that we're living in now where everybody on a social media platform, I mean, these are not optimized for human connection. The social media platforms are created intentionally to trigger our most, you know, reptilian brainstem fight or flight responses. And that means, you know, seeing all those other people as potential threats, as competition 
not as humans to engage with, but as as others. You know, and even even well-meaning technologies, say you know uh, Skype or some video chat, you don't really see the other person. You you can't establish real rapport. You don't see if their pupils are getting larger or smaller, if their breathing rate is syncing up with yours. So all of those mechanisms we've been talking about, that the painstakingly evolved mechanisms for for establishing you know social cohesion and collaborating and cooperating, all of those are defeated. So you get done with that phone call, you know on some level the person said they agreed with me, but I don't feel it in my body and my bloodstream. So you don't you don't blame the technology for that. You know, we haven't evolved to know from media. We blame the other person. And that's <laughs> that's not good. So we more that we try to connect with this technology, the more addicted to the tech we become because it's not quite filling that need for connection, but the less trust in other people we have. So yeah, we start looking at one another as, will he boost my ratings? Well, if I like what they just tweeted, will it lead to me getting more followers or something like that? And the whole sort of the, the whole premise that these platforms were here to help us connect more meaningfully as people with one another, you know, that's totally undermined. Yeah, it's funny. Social media is not social at all. It requires no social interaction or social awareness whatsoever. And uh, I'm guilty on what you were just talking about. I've blamed people for the issues that I've had with them through social media instead of just blaming the technology, which is really like, hey, that's why I said, you know, I made a concerted effort at some point in the last couple of years to be like, let's take this out of the digital space. I don't need to text you. I don't need to DM you. I don't need to chat with you on the phone sometimes even. I just want to see your face in person and communicate that way because to me, there's no misunderstandings, Doug. You know exactly where you stand with people in those moments, and that's what I love about it. Right. But even if you don't consciously, at least you're in there with them. You know, at least you're experiencing the genuine ambiguity of human to human contact. You know, the, the thing that humans can do that computers can't is occupy those liminal spaces, the things between yes and no, the the, we can sustain ambiguity and weirdness over time. That's humans. You know, computers are compelled to resolve everything right away. Is it a one? Is it a zero? Is it a this or that? You know, they have to have certainty at all times. And gosh, that's a shame. You know, it's, it's, it's not a shame for computers. I'm fine. That's the way they are. But it's a shame for people to ache for that kind of certainty. You know, and I understand it. We're probably jealous of our machines that they have that certainty that they, you know, go to sleep without worrying about anything. But that worry, I mean, you got to flip that a little bit, that worry, that fear, that strangeness, that that novelty, the unresolved stuff, the new situations. Those are the reasons to be alive. Those are (laughs) that's the good part, not the bad part. Yeah. And just around the same point, you know, I just want to read something that that you wrote because I think it's pertinent here. But you said that Thinking, feeling, connected people undermine the institutions that would control them. They always have. That's why new mechanisms for forging bonds are almost inevitably turned against those ends. Language that could inform us instead is used to lie. Money that could promote trade is instead hoarded by the wealthy. And education that could expand workers' minds is instead used to make them more efficient human resources. We've talked about all that already, but I think that was a great way to just sort of encapsulate this part of the chat. I don't have a question there, but if you have any further comment on that, please do throw it out there. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important for people to see that it didn't just start with the digital, you know, that it's been that money is another great one. We were just talking about that, how money used to be a way of promoting transactions between people. And now it's become this, you know, this weapon, you know, it's this way for it's this way to really to justify not letting people have food or shelter. You say, oh, well, they don't have money, so we're not going to let them live in this house. We'd rather tear it down or we're going to burn this food, which the U.S. Department of Agriculture does every week. We're going to burn this food rather than just let hungry people eat it because they don't have jobs, so we can't let them have it. And it's like, wait a minute. The, the point of a job should be because something needs to get done, not as a way of justifying letting somebody eat. That's kind of an ass backwardsness that we've kind of, you know, just taken into ourselves as a necessary logic. And it's not. It's, it's, just, it's just nonsense. Okay, let me ask you this then. So I've come to understand and learn in my own life that human beings 
connect with each other so easily. Like, it's actually really easy to develop a connection with somebody and a rapport if you just take the time and make the effort. Why does it seem so hard for a lot of us to actually do that then? Is it the the constant, you know, tunnel vision into a screen or is it something deeper? I wonder sometimes. I mean, we live, we've been living in an intentionally desocialized society, really, since the 50s. You know, since uh, FDR worked with the Levitt brothers to build Levittown, and we started to build communities that were, you know, intentionally designed to prevent solidarity between people because they were worried that, you know, this would, people would establish unions or revolts or become communist. So the idea was to keep each man sort of so busy just, you know, maintaining his lawn that he didn't really have time and his, and paying for his mortgage that he didn't have time to meet with other guys in a bar. Plus they would zone these neighborhoods so that there were no businesses. There were no places for people to congregate. And that eventually just becomes the way things are. You don't, you don't think of it as, oh, I live in a desocialized landscape. You're just, you're too busy to go out on Sunday with people anyway. You're just, you know, you work six days a week and then you shop on the seventh. So you don't even have the opportunities. You're, you're just fellow consumers at the mall. You're not playing bridge or something. I mean, people in the old days, they like played cards and stuff. They went over to each other's houses. They had pianos that somebody would always know how to play the piano and they would like sing songs together. I mean, could you imagine that? I mean, it's like, <laughs> it would be so embarrassing for most people today, but that's because we've developed our, our culture to maximize the purchase of products and to minimize the ability to get any kind of social need fulfilled by other people. You know, and that's why you end up with, you know, digital titans wanting, you know, Japanese sex dolls instead of real people in their lives. <laughs> that's funny, though. Yeah. Not guilty of that one specifically, but I hear you. But um, <laughs> so talked about being human is a team sport. That's where the team human comes from. Uh, we've kind of talked around this point that we cannot be fully human alone either. I want to read something else and then ask you a question. You said that anything that brings us together fosters our humanity. Likewise, anything that separates us makes us less human and less able to exercise our individual or collective will. We use our social connections to orient ourselves, to ensure mutual survival, and to derive meaning and purpose. Uh, No argument here, Doug, obviously, but that last bit there about meaning and purpose, I think is uniquely human. You know, like, like my cat does not, I think, have the ability to derive meaning and purpose for her existence. It seems unnecessary to her. She's just concerned with survival, right? So why do you think the human story now is so different? You know, because at some point we were only concerned with survival ourselves. What changed? Why do you think we need meaning and purpose in our lives now? Has that trumped our need for survival too? I mean, where did did that extra human element, that meaning part come in? I think it's partly because we're aware, you know, we're, we're, probably more self-aware than most other creatures out there. Not all, you know, I mean, I don't know about the the octopi and the pigs and the whales and stuff. Some of them seem pretty smart and social and communicative. And, you know, they might be thinking some pretty profound thoughts about, you know, who are we? They just don't have like opposable thumbs or a need to build stuff. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, so it doesn't look like us. But I don't know. I think I mean, I don't want to get too spiritual on you, but you know, you're 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 occulter, so there's some likely some spiritual part there. You know, I think that this sense of of meaning and purpose and dignity, I think is uh, it's kind of a pre-existing condition. I don't look at it as something that developed because of evolution over time that we learned that through, you know, reciprocal altruism I'm going to be nice to your baby or or I'm going to stop the tiger from eating your baby so that someday you would stop a tiger from eating my baby. I don't think it's that sort of altruistic expectation. I think I naturally want to stop the tiger from eating someone's baby because I I empathize. I it's someone's baby. <laughs> I don't know why it's so hard for scientists to explain that one, but it only is if they don't believe that we come in with something. And I It's kind of like a Mr. Rogers frame of life, but, you know, I think that you're special just the way you are. I think that you have essential, an essential human dignity that 
has value, you know, beyond your utility value, beyond the value that you provide the market. And I feel like if you don't accept that human beings have souls, or at least soul, you know, this force, this animating soul force thing, then it's really hard to distinguish a human from a worker, say. Then why not just exploit people or be exploited oneself? And and so, yeah, so I go to this other place with it. And I think that human beings, you know, whether it's the what we do, our relationship to the quantum field out there, whether we're receivers or projectors or whatever we are, resolvers, I think that meaning is, it's like meaning is the pre-existing condition of human life, not some result of human life. We're meaning makers. That's, that's what we are. That's like our formal cause, according to Aristotle. Yeah. And you mentioned two things in that answer that I want to touch on. The first one is you use that term reciprocal altruism. You use that in the book too. What does that mean exactly? And why does it not work? Well, it may. I mean, reciprocal altruism is a reductionist scientist's way of understanding why people do nice things for each other. It's not community. People are not good. People are selfish actors. We do everything for ourselves, everything for our own personal survival. So the reason that you would save someone else's child is so that you could then have the expectation that they would save your child. That's reciprocal altruism. It's not genuine altruism. It's altruism for a purpose so that I get it back from you. And I don't buy that. I think altruism is a core essential quality of of humans. And when we try to explain it away as selfish, we then deny ourselves the ability to think of ourselves as higher order beings, as 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 genuinely sympathetic empathetic loving creatures you know it's part of this this free market libertarian reduction of all human activity to selfish economic behaviors rather than divine human behaviors yeah and you also mentioned uh, spirituality in that that previous answer too you made a point that i i want to clarify because i'm really unsure what you meant by it you said that once our humanity is seen as a liability instead of a strength, the corresponding cultural drive and spiritual quest is to transcend our personhood, a journey out of body, away from our humanness, beyond matter, and into whatever substrate we fetishize at that moment, be it ether, electrical wavelengths, virtual reality, or AI, end quote. And so, Doug, many of the other guests I've had on here and a lot of the audience are really into this, you know, transcending personhood thing that you reference here, this out-of-body journey beyond matter and so on. You just chatted with uh, Jason Louv, you know, not too long ago. I've interviewed him a couple times very much into the idea of of unlocking these substrates with magic and meditation and, and so on. But I want to be clear about this quote I read because I could read this like you're saying that these sorts of spiritual quests are maybe disconnecting us from our humanity. Is that what you meant or did you mean something else? No, I think they're pretty stupid. I do. I think they're they're not so much dangerous as they are informed by our own self-hatred. I get that. Human beings have done bad things. Our parents have done bad things to us. We're guilty about stuff that we've done. And it's a very American urge when you know you just did something bad to try to run away from it. Let's just get away from it. So, okay, we're responsible for the slavery of hundreds of thousands of African people. Don't look back. Just move. Get to California. Look forward. Look over the ocean. Get out of your body. Take more acid. Go up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Reach self-actualization. Just get out of this thing. No, I don't think it's that hopeless. I I do think that we've done bad things, but that rather than having this kind of linear Western achievement-oriented cause and effect understanding of the spiritual journey, I have a kind of an older, more circular one. I believe more in reincarnation, in seeing everybody again, in cycles. I don't even really believe in linear time as such, before and after. I don't think there could be before your awakening and after your awakening, while you're still in the body, after you got out of the body, while you're still just a human, then after when you're a super being, doesn't work like that. Sorry. You know, 
we're just here. Every shitty thing you've done to everybody, you're going to come up against them again. You are. Sorry. And I'm not sorry. You should be glad that none of those things are done, that all the things bad that you've done and everyone has done, the people you've done them to, you're going to see them again. You know, It's going to come back around. That was part of why the indigenous spiritual traditions, the ones that didn't have linear time, that didn't have a history and a future, while they didn't have a notion of progress, which you know, is, is a shame in some ways because progress could lead to an ethical imperative, making the world a better place, to kun olam, let's have laws, let's push for social justice. A lot of that's great. It's also, it's a problem to think of things in terms of progress when you use that as an excuse to sort of think that you can escape, that you can get away from what you've done, that you can, you know, not, I don't know, act with, act with this kind of impunity. You know, it's like the, um, the billionaires I know who, you know, essentially what they're asking me to help them do is to figure out how they could drive their car so fast that they'll never have to breathe their own exhaust. And it just doesn't work that way, you know, and I get it that human beings, humanity is living in the sort of social, cultural, spiritual exhaust of all of our bad actions. But the answer is not to try to rocket ship away from them. It doesn't, it doesn't go. You know, the, the rocket ship thing, this sort of transhumanist vibe, we actually imported, I write about this in the book, we imported it from Russia. It was when um, at the Esalen Institute in the West Coast, this place in Big Sur with lots of hot tubs, it was started in the late 60s, it kind of reached its heyday in the 70s and 80s. They decided to do these things called two-track diplomacy meetings where they were going to get like the spiritual people and the scientists and the technologists of Russia or the Soviet Union and the United States together at Esalen. And they would all do acid and sit in the hot tubs and create a kind of a a conspiracy, if you will, a, a positive conspiracy to counteract the Cold War divide between our two nations. They figured if we got the elite scientists and spiritualists and engineers and all sort of working and thinking together then the elites in government would have to follow suit. And it kind of did. It was part of what pushed, you know, the Gorbachev, Yeltsin, uh, you know, perestroika thing. But what really happened at those meetings was, you know, a bunch of our kind of weird psychedelic West Coast people, the Esalen people and John Lilly and Shasha Shulgin and, you know, interesting, weird people met with their, these people called cosmists from Russia. And cosmists, was a kind of a Russian New Age sci-fi tradition. And what they did was they took the Russian Orthodoxy, which was a form of Christianity that has lots of personal transcendence, where you actually personally transform, you transmute like, like Jesus did. You know, if you get fully awakened or whatever, you rise right out of the body. That those folks, when they became New Age and techno, they started to think of our technological future as being able to put human brains in robots or upload consciousness. They believed in longevity and living forever. And that understanding of yourself living forever outside the body, it dovetailed so perfectly with the 1970s self-improvement, me generation, you, you're the one individual Reagan American consumer that we ended up hybridizing that, bringing it together into this sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, self-actualized individual will go to Esalen and get all the right stuff and get the right trainings and pay the right money and do the right practice and have the right teacher and buy the right technology and get out of this cesspool of human suffering. And that's really the opposite of Buddhism. It's the opposite of even what Crowley would talk about. It's not about getting out. It's about getting in. You know, it's tuning in. It's 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 recovering the human, retrieving the body. This is where it's at. And even if you're going to go somewhere else, you're going to go there by falling into this reality, not trying to escape it. There is no escape. Don't run. That creates unnecessary dualities. You're you're here. It's all good. Wow, that was a that was a pretty epic answer there, man. And I have to <laughs> <laughs> I have to say though that you know. 
I agree with you, obviously, because that's why I asked the question, because I, I just wanted to, to clarify if the way that I was reading that and feeling about what you wrote was, was accurate. Because when I first was lightly pursuing what we call spirituality, I felt more disconnected from myself and from my own humanity than I ever had. I felt like I was kind of just floating through this place, just detached almost from physical reality, which is dangerous because, you know, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, you know, we're, we're living in physical reality, right? I mean, and I get increasingly frustrated these days with people who seemingly discount physical reality in favor of a more spiritual realm or whatever, because I don't know, I just think, I just think it's dangerous. And I think it, that does more to disconnect us from this experience and each other than the technology could ever, maybe. Well, right. I mean, and it's, maybe it's not dangerous for you, the individual who's doing all these journeys, but you're not doing the necessary work. I mean, there's a lot of people out here, out in the world who are suffering right now. We have a civilization that is, you know, on the brink of collapse and we'll make not just ourselves extinct, but we might make a whole, I mean, we're currently making a whole lot of other species extinct. There's so much real work to be done in the real world. And that real work is transformational in ways that you really can hardly imagine. So yes, it's beautiful to sit. I sit. I do yoga. I, I'm working, but I'm not sitting in order to escape. There is, I mean, and I will admit it. There is a place when you're when you're sitting that you get to that's like sometimes anyway that is kind of open or different or beyond your thoughts. You know, there's that that clear space between the thoughts sometimes, but it's not like you want to then, Oh, now I'm going to go there or something. It's, it's there all the time, you know, but it's not like you want to just go there while you're alive. It's, it's, um, there's going to be time for that later. (laughs) You know, there's all these other people here who need our love and support. And the satisfaction of of connecting with someone else is is so much more real in this dimension than these these kind of transdimensional experiences. I mean, I guess if you're a shaman, you know, and you really have to be, you know, doing travel on behalf of others, which is the real shamans are doing that. Yeah, they're tripping all the time and going out, but that's really so they can do the sort of extra dimensional work on behalf of other human beings. You go to the shaman, oh, I'm having this problem, and they can travel in the, you know, quantum realm and see, oh, your cancer is actually this. Or, you know, they, they'll, they'll have some other metaphor, way of understanding it. So even they're not doing it for personal, you know, a personal escape trip. They're doing it as service to their tribe, you know? So it's even for them, it it's it's a different it's something else. And I just think it's so easy to see the human body is dirty and sex is all wet and strange and other people, they, they have neuroses and they get the flu and, uh, you know, and they're selfish or they, I mean, I could see the, the whole, uh, let me just get away from these people. But that's, um, that's not where it, where it goes. You know, you look at the, what does the Bodhisattva do? You know, they come back right away, <laughs> you know, and help the others. Yeah. yeah, I think we could all learn a lesson like that in our lives. I know I've also been guilty of doing that too, just in the past and just kind of pushing people away when I get to that point, you know, where I feel like I have to be by myself. But then I realized, man, I hate being by myself. Not hate it. I mean, it's been good, but uh, it's just so nice to actually sit in a room with somebody I don't have to say anything, you know, just being in a room with somebody is so much more, uh, I don't know, satisfying, I guess. So, you know, something else too, that I think goes along well with this is nature and how we are a part of nature and nature, as you say in the book is a, is a collaborative act and that all these life forms, you know, like trees and fungi are always subtly and silently communicating with each other to create this healthy ecosystem that we should be mimicking probably you know but we aren't for a lot of reasons and i love little details like one you shared in the book about the acacia tree do you remember that one how they protect each other yeah i mean i think they they release enzymes that warn other trees what's happening so it's like you start getting eaten by a giraffe Um, they release enzymes that then teach tell other trees to like release their their scent that 
giraffes don't like, you know, <laughs> it's like, so they're actually communicating what is threatening them at any given time so that the other trees can then know what defense mechanisms to prepare. So even as a tree is going down, <laughs> it's like, I'm going down, they're eating me, but hey guys, um, here's what's happening. Uh, yeah. Or, you know, of course the, even to me, clearer example is when the, the tall trees that I was taught were crowding out the smaller trees for sunlight so that the little ones die. Um, it turns out that's not what's happening at all. The tall trees are sharing nutrients with the little trees, you know, during the summer when, when they have the light. And then the little trees that are evergreens then share nutrients back under the ground with the, with the big trees during the, during the winter months. And there's a whole network of mycelia under the ground that are, you know, arranging that they're, they're doing the transport of the nutrients and taking a service fee for the, the, the privilege of, uh, of, of doing that. So, you know, we're seeing really what evolution is about. And all you have to do really is read the Darwin rather than listen to what economists say that Darwin was saying. If you read the original text, even just a teeny portion of it or the cliff notes, even what you'll see is Darwin is saying, no, it's not. He doesn't talk about survival of the fittest individual. What he talks about is the way that species collaborate and cooperate in order to sustain themselves and one another. Yeah. And I think too, you know, that goes well with something I wanted to talk about. You know, I, I went through this phase where I got almost hyper individualistic, you know, which I, I thought would be self-empowering, but it turned out to be the opposite. And you actually wrote about this in the book, you know, about individualism and how it disconnects us from our humanity. How does it do that? Well, it's lonely. I mean, it, <laughs> it does it in a lot of ways. First off, you know, the idea of the individual wasn't really invented until the Renaissance. Although you could say, you know, the, and the Renaissance people, it's a rebirth anyway, they borrowed it from the ancient Greeks, this notion of the individual hero. But it's really a, um, it's a contrivance. You know, so we had, you know, we got the, the book, which could be read by an individual. We got perspective painting, which has an individual perspective. You know, here's a point of view looking at the thing. And we had the invention of the first individual, real individual characters like Dr. Faustus, who were, you know, striving to become complete, you know, by themselves. We got the Vitruvian man, that sort of the, 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 that drawing of, you know, the, the one guy in the circle and the square. So there was this sort of this notion of self that got invented in the Renaissance, which was, you know, happy in some ways because it led to one man, one vote in the Enlightenment and personal salvation of the Protestant Reformation. But it led us to kind of surrender so much of our understanding of community and togetherness. And it led to a world where, you know, everyone on the block needs to have their own lawnmower instead of having one lawnmower that we could share. And no, it's not that inconvenient. It's, it's less inconvenient to share it than it is for everyone to have to buy one and store one and earn enough money to have it. You know, the only reason we all need our own lawnmower is so that the lawnmower company can sell more lawnmowers. And you could say, well, that's important so that they can hire more people. But why do those people need jobs if it's not work that actually needs to be done? What if we start working four days, three days, two days, one day per week? If all the work is getting done, then we shouldn't try to figure out oh, let's figure out more jobs for people making plastic crap that we'll end up throwing in the ocean anyway and killing the fish. You know, what if we, what if we just have people do work that actually needs, that needs to get done? You know, if we looked at it from that perspective, then all of a sudden there's all these old people that are going to have companions and, and, you know, all these bridges that can get built and, and, and children that could be taught. Oh man, a fucking men to that. So you know, Doug, I've long thought that writing changed a lot of things for humans because we no longer had to use our brain to remember things. And once we started writing down things, like, you know, history, for example, mm. uh, not just writing it, but trusting it and believing it, that it became easier to manipulate it or control it or just flat out make it up. But that's writing. And you take some of that same sentiment even further and apply it to language as a whole in general. You say language changed everything for us. How so? Well, yeah. I mean, the main thing I was trying to do was show people that this isn't just some digital thing. You know, that every time we extend ourselves with a new medium, um, we lose something else. There's, there's a give and a take. So, you know, text is a pretty clear one. And that's part of why we got the Bible and the Talmud 
was we were moving from an oral-based society into a text-based society. And the ethicists of that period, the rabbis understood that, uh uh-oh, this is going to be different, you know, with contracts and laws and this disconnection when people could lie to each other in such easier ways by writing stuff down and not even being there. You can't even read the person's face. You know, they're just saying, yeah, I promise this and who knows. So, so they understood that. And I was trying to make it, make people understand that it's not just like technology. It's, you know, language itself. Before we had words, we couldn't lie. You know, you could kind of hide a piece of food, I guess, from someone or look like you don't know something, but you couldn't make a, a, a you couldn't actively lie. <laughs> you know, before, you know, before you had language and you could say, no, I don't know where the fruit trees are. That's just lying already. Or, or yes, this is all there was. Or no, I didn't, I didn't have sex with your wife or, you know, whatever, uh, <laughs> whatever thing. And, and so, so language for all of its connecting ability, language also gave us the ability to disconnect in new ways. Yeah, and you also said that language has binding power or gives us binding power. What did you mean by that exactly? Yeah, well, that's actually from this guy Korzybski. I mean, he talked about how how plants bind the energy of the sun. You know, they take all the energy of the course of the day and they can bind it through photosynthesis into, you know, their own flesh, you know, that now has that energy in it that, you know, you could go eat it or whatever. And uh, animals bind space so that a little squirrel can run around a whole field or something and eat the nuts from the whole space. So they're not just stuck getting, you know, their energy from one place. They can, you know, move around space. And human beings, you know, we can bind time. And what that means is that instead of having to have every experience firsthand, we can tell our kids, okay, these trees are good. Those trees are bad. You know, this food works. That food doesn't try doing it this way rather than that way. So all the experiences of the prior generations end up bound in our instructions that we can give one another. So language ends up, you know, making it so not everyone has to experience everything in order to benefit, you know, from the knowledge of it. And then, you know, when I was thinking about, you know, if if artificial intelligences and these, you know, Internet of Things algorithms are kind of the next life form, then what is it that they bind? And what I was thinking was that they bind, they bind us. You know, they are they they sit out there they're they're trying everything they can to manipulate our behavior and then when they find something that works they all tell each other oh look this worked on my human you try it on yours you try it on yours so what they're really trying to do is bind you know bind humanity in in order to extract our data and and manipulate our behavior with that so it's a <laughs> it's funny i mean uh, i like to think of it in an occult framework is sort of the easiest one to explain to people that algorithms are like demons. You know, that's the mm-hmm. easiest yeah. way to understand them, that we, we put these things out there. We cast these things out there, that we teach them what are our weaknesses, what are our vulnerabilities, what are human exploits, so they can exploit humans and get human beings to do things that are not in their own best interests. You know, how is that different from a demon? You know, what does a demon do? It's something that exploits our psychology. It learns about us in order to get us to act against our own and our and our friend's best interests. Absolutely. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that, too, because I heard you say that in a couple other interviews. And uh, you also said uh, in your book that, you know, Team Human's real enemies are not just the people trying to program us into submission, but the algorithms that they've unleashed to help them do it. And that's that's a great sort of uh, encapsulation of what you just said, too. And, you know, Doug, if we can consider language a technology, uh, which I think we can in some way, or many mm-hmm. ways maybe, uh, then it seems like, you know, that it was just the first in line of many technologies that started out altruistic, but was then solely compromised and used against us on some level, much like the internet is now and television before that, uh, and so on. Yeah, but when it was done by language, it wasn't really corporations yet, you know? So, mm-hmm. I mean, it's part of why it's nice to go back there, is to say, okay, even before oil, you know, before the stock market, people were enslaving other people. People were extracting value out of other people. I mean, the Bible tells the story. Joseph taught the king how to use interest, how to use debt in order to control people. And uh, so, you know, they they understood that uh, they understood these these phenomena a long, long, long time ago. You know, we're just 
they're so embedded in our worldview now that we think that they are, you know, conditions of nature, but they're not. They're, they're choices that we make and we can choose otherwise. And now we're at a juncture as a species where if we don't choose otherwise, this is really it, you know, and that, and that, that's why we owe it to ourselves to, to, to take charge of this. I don't think, I think it's the boomers who are trying to run away, you know, and, and I think that, that we, you know, um, can, can choose a different path. There is, I really do not believe there is an escape. There is no escape, whether it's Elon Musk going to Mars or, you know, the DMT head trying to get to that other level. I don't think you, you can get out of here, you know, not until it's over. And, and even then, I don't know where you go. So I, I think it's, it's, it's our job to make this place as, as comfortable and kind as we can. Absolutely. Yeah. And I wanted to explain too this concept of the figure in the ground that you use in the book. I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of ways to look at it, but really what, what the main thing I was arguing is that, you know, human beings are no longer the users of technology. We are the used. You know, we are, every time you swipe on your smartphone, your smartphone gets smarter about you and you get dumber about it. The Facebook platform, is not there when they're they're working on it. They're not thinking, how can we help users do this or users do that? They're thinking, how can the platform get this from people or that from people? You know, we are not the message. You know, we are the medium. We are the thing. We are the landscape. And, you know, one way to talk about that is this, you know, notion of figure and ground, which was originally it was that psychology experiment where they had you look at this picture and some people see a goblet or a vase and other people see the two two faces on either side in profile. And, you know, the faces on the side are kind of seen as a, uh, they would be sort of the background and the cup is, or vase in the middle would be the, the figure. Or, or do you see the faces as the figure and then the cup as sort of the background negative space? And I do think that human beings can, can go back and forth between figure and ground, but now we're all ground. Now, just like the kid in a classroom who's being taught you know, the skills he's going to need for his job, he's no longer the subject of education. He's now the object of education. You know, when we, when we, when we argue that, oh, you're not the customer of Facebook, you're the product. That's another way of saying you've gone from kind of the figure to being the ground. And um, I want people to become more conscious of that. um, So they can, you know, reassert themselves as the figure of their own story. I think another phrase that comes in here is this term uh, persuasive technology, which is used in the book. And you say that the goal of that is to generate behavioral change and habit formation without the user's consent. And that this is actually being taught in universities, which I think you mentioned earlier, but this is more reflective of like a wartime psyop than it is modern advertising. And it, it thwarts our cognition and it, it makes thought itself essentially nearly impossible. Kind of what you said earlier about the smartphone, like it's getting smarter about us, and but we're getting dumber about it. So Right. Yeah. yeah. There's the division at Stanford, you know, BJ Fogg's Captology division, which is about, you know, behavior design through technology. You do whatever you can to the person to to evade their neocortex, their all their whole frontal lobe and all the higher faculties and speak directly to their brainstem, get them to respond angrily, reactively, you know, instinctually to things, which may feel good on a certain level, on a certain Trumpian level. I'm just coming from my gut and all that but it lacks compassion and higher thought and well it lacks most of your humanity it brings you back down to the to the reptile state and that's a kind of a shame that's where most of the money and research is going it's applying the laws of behavioral economics to the way we act in social media spaces and those are all zero sum logics those are all based on the like the prisoner's dilemma you know scarcity, zero sum understanding of our world. And to, just to even know that, that all the time you spend on social media is with the presumption that you are in a dog eat dog fight against other people for limited resources, that any other person there is a potential competitor or threat, and that the whole universe of social media is being designed to make you feel that way about other people. That's got to give you some pause and to say, oh, wait a minute, you know, is this, is this where I want to be spending my time? Is this how I want to be meeting people? 
you know, is this the context that I want to be discussing uh, my work? Maybe not. Yeah, man. And one thing, Doug, that I like to talk about with people is art. And I haven't heard you talk about this much in some other interviews that you've done about the book here, but you did say that art at its best mines the paradoxes that make humans human. I was curious if you could tell us what are those paradoxes exactly, and how does art sort of excavate them? Well, I mean, it's just I'm just talking about like the difference between a uh, traditional Hollywood feature with a beginning, a middle, and a certain end, and the bad guy you know, goes up in a fireball and the good guy gets the girl or something and a real piece of art, like a David Lynch movie that you can watch and not even know what happened and still have had a really rich experience, you know, and that's something that really only humans can do. You know, a computer is going to want to know what was this about? What happened? Who won? Who lost? Where's the one? Where do I put the one? Where do I put the zero? Which plot line is this? And You know, Lynch confounds us because his movies are about something, but they're not. You know, it's like these Kubrick scenes that, you know, Kubrick, when he was directing his scenes, he was trying to get actors to kind of act badly so that whoever's watching the scene can interpret what's going on in any number of ways. It's kind of the opposite. There is no thing. There is no definitive understanding of a scene. It's all everything. He's tapping into something deeper, some these these sort of essential shapes that work in any number of in any number of contexts. So what is that? You know, it's it's art that tries to bring us to that weird place that brings us to the liminal place between waking and sleeping, uh, you know, between being high and not high, between understanding and not. You know, it's those it's those in between places where humans find their their weirdness, you know, their novelty, their their specialness. And I'd argue that's our dignity too. You know, that's where that's where you you find the the sweet stuff, the nectar that makes life worth living. And you know, we're living in a culture that's so addicted to endings and conclusions and certainty because you know, is it yes or no? Did did you buy it or not? Did you make money? Did you win on this or did you lose on that? And it's like, no, wait a minute. You know, maybe all those binaries are really false and there's something much more squishy and weird and wonderful going on here. And art, when I think art's at its best, it's encouraging people to be able to stay in that place and not be too scared of it. Absolutely, man. Guilty of some of that too that you were talking about, unfortunately. But uh, Yeah, we all are. Yeah, for sure. And I like the way that you phrase this in the book, too, that that commercial entertainment has a goal to validate the status quo values by which we already live, reinforce consumerism, and most of all, reassure that there is certainty in this world. But pro-human art and culture does the opposite. It produces open-ended stories and doesn't answer questions, only raises them. So Mm. I thought that was pretty cool. And let's raise one last question here, Doug, then. How do we reassert this human agenda, this team human agenda? Is there a definitive overarching way or is it looking at each of these areas that you've written about in the book, you know, technology, economics, digital media, et cetera? Is it just looking at those areas and just trying to optimize them one by one for us? I mean, I think it's going to be different for different people. You know, one of my my regrets in the way I've been talking about the book, I guess, over time is that people think this is a book about something because most books now are kind of, especially nonfiction books, they're like, this is a book about this. Here's a book about that. This is not a book about something. This is a book that is a thing in itself. It's an experience. It's like saying, what's acid about? You know, well, what is it about? You take it, you know, (laughs) it's about that. This book is about the experience of reading this book. So, you know, and, and without trying to sound like, oh, just buy this thing. I mean, you don't have to buy it. Just read it. That is a process. I spent years and years trying to figure out a way through literature to take people through an experience that is fundamentally transformative. And that's what I tried to do here. I created, you know, and it's, I know people don't know from books anymore, but that's books originally were, were, were experiences of, of their own. You know, it was a novel was a thing and even a nonfiction book could be this this an experiential reality through which a person passes 
rather than some data that somebody absorbs. Beyond that, I would say one of the the easiest ways to step on this journey is to start trying to find the others. You know, that's the main thing I'm arguing people do. You know, try not to have so much fear that you can't look in other people's eyes. And it just starts, you know, today when you go outside, if you're in New York like me, walk down the streets of New York, not looking at your phone and trying to find people who are willing to make eye contact. You know, when you find someone who is, it's like you're part of this secret club. Everybody else is staring in their devices and you're now one of the the secret walkers, you know, <laughs> they're the non-walker. They're all the zombies. And you're like one of the other living people. And it's fun, that sense of connection you get. And it's it's contagious. It's it's giggly. I mean, you don't have to, it's not like you have to see them. You don't have to meet up with them and then go into a Starbucks with them. You just see them around and you start to kind of encourage and reinforce this notion that some of us are awake and already out there looking for other awakened people. Absolutely, man. So Doug, tell people where they can find the podcast, tell people where they can find the book and keep up with the rest of your work if they're interested. Well, you can just go to, uh, I mean, the book's called Team Human. You can find it everywhere, even in audio, which is kind of fun, I think, you know, because I got to read it and it's Mm -hmm. like my podcast that way. But um, yeah, Team Human, you can go to teamhuman.fm. That's where my podcast is or rushkoff.com is just all my stuff. But yeah, check it out. I'm also doing a Team Human live events occasionally. So if you go to teamhuman.fm, you can see, you know, some of that stuff. Doug, thanks so much for the time. Again, really appreciate it. Love the chat. Love the book. Love the podcast. Love you, man. Again, best of luck to you as you venture forward down this path of uh, reclaiming our humanity one person at a time. Well, thank you. Hopefully we've, we've reached one or two others just today. I think we have. All right. You be good. And there you have it. My thanks again to Douglas Rushkoff for bringing the heat like only he can. And my thanks to all of you who made it this far. You are valued and respected members of the team, and please do not forget that. You know, there are plenty of takeaways for me from this chat, but I think the one that hit me the most wasn't anything I noticed live, but when I was listening back to this in post-production... I had mentioned something about feeling disconnected from my own humanity and my own physical reality. And when I heard myself say that, I stopped the recording and just sat in silence for quite a while, thinking about it, feeling it, trying to process it. And I realized I had sort of contextualized that to myself along the way here, that I was disconnected from something, but it wasn't until I had a conversation just a week or two ago with my closest friend that everything became illuminated. She told me she missed the version of me that enjoyed these simple human things. She missed the guy who wasn't so immersed in this, you know, pursuit of the esoteric. And that hit me pretty hard. It snapped me out of this trance I think I've been in for quite some time. I mean, I think I was already gradually on my way back to that version of me, but, you know, hearing her say that in the way she said it, in the tone that she said it, it really got me, I don't know, next level woke, I guess, about my own damn self. And the best part about this... You know, this was a face-to-face conversation in a moment where we were both vulnerable with each other and open to each other, a positive, mutual energy exchange. It felt like two parts became a whole again in that moment, a reconnection not only within ourselves, but with each other. And it was, I don't know, it was everything you would ever want to experience in a moment with another person. Just this deeply rooted bond that's based on compassion and empathy and understanding and understanding and friendship and love. And you know, I've been pretty distant uh, from the digital space, actually, since the new year. And that's both by design and out of necessity. I not only want these sorts of connections and reconnections in my life, I also need them. That's the bitch of taking up a hobby such as this and trying to build an audience and then maintain an audience and starting a Patreon. I know you guys expect maybe a certain level of access to me, and I wish I could give more of my time and energy and attention, you know, to the Discord channel or to the live Zoom chats or to posting more on social media even. But I just can't, you know, and that's disappointing to me, but it's also been pretty fucking liberating, and I'm more than content with that trade-off. And before I even booked Doug for this chat, I made it a priority of mine to reclaim my own humanity, to play for Team Human again, and to make this space right here, this digital space, work better for me as I do that. And if that means there's less Discord discussion, or fewer followers on social media, or even less people supporting the Patreon, I'm okay with that as long as we're all making a conscious effort to 
connect and reconnect with real people in physical space. And as much as I'd like this to be, this is not a full-time gig for me, and it probably never will be. And for more than two years now, I've treated it like it was, and it has damn near killed me. And the only thing that's revived me has been interactions like the one I just shared. Beautiful moments like that are really what leads you to the completion of your own great work, you know, to your own inner transformation. Like Doug said in this chat, you cannot do this alone. You need other people. You need the other alchemists and the magicians and the artists and the creatives and the healers but you also need the farmers and the plumbers and the factory workers and the social workers and the line cooks and the cashiers and the bartenders and the baristas and the teachers and the students. You need the like-minded and the open-minded, but you also need the unlike-minded and the closed-minded. That's where you're going to learn the most about what it means to be human, but that's also where you're going to learn the most about what it means to be you. Anyway, a uh, shout out to new patrons Gwen and Dark Phoenix to returning patron Vanessa and to new executive producer Blake. Thank you guys so much for thinking that this is a worthwhile cause to donate to. I'm continually amazed that people find this valuable enough to put even a dollar into. And if you think chats like this with Douglas Rushkoff are worthwhile and want to support them, patreon.com slash oculture is the place to do so. Got some really cool and uh, varied episodes ahead. The next one is a, a more traditional occult-themed episode, and then we're kind of all over the map. But if anything, it will be fun. Uh, and speaking of fun, on Saturday, March 23rd, uh, for patrons on Patreon, we'll be doing another Occulture After Dark live chat at 10.30 p.m. Eastern. We're just going to kick it on Zoom for a bit for anyone who's around and wants to join in. It's about time I, I do try to reconnect with some of you in the digital space. It's also time to give away another book, so one of you will win a copy of Doug's book, Team Human. Uh, if you're on Patreon, you're already entered into that giveaway, and if you're not on Patreon and still want a chance to win the book, email me with your deets at oculture at protonmail.com. And also, if you're on Patreon, stay tuned to the posts over the next couple months because there may be a new audio endeavor here that I'll definitely want your input on if and when I get around to making it happen. And I really do want to make it happen, so hopefully it's just a matter of time. And speaking of time, the top of that hourglass has run out of sand, but we will flip that script again real soon. But until we do, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority.